you know, a lot of us, when it comes to genealogies, how many of you either skim them or you skip them? Let's just be honest. Let's just raise your hand there real quick. Okay, lots of hands, and some of you are lying today. But uh, nevertheless, um, you know, for, I'll just be honest. For me, a lot of times the Christmas story, when I open up the book of Matthew, it starts in verse 18. Not verses 1 through 17, but uh, this past week, actually, Pastor Rob sort of put this series together, and so he's going to be here in a couple of weeks, and he'll preach one of the messages in it. And, but nevertheless, he put the series together and put the scripture together. I was like, all right, I guess i got to study this passage. And so I did, and I just have to tell you, there is so much incredible truth in this passage, in this genealogy that I want to kind of get into uh, today. But um, the first thing I'll just mention, you know, about genealogies, some of you are not interested in genealogies. Um, Some of you uh, have lots of relatives, and after Thanksgiving break, you wish that you didn't have as much relatives as you do. In fact, you're not interested in learning about any more of them. Uh, But others are very fascinated with genealogies, right? I mean, genealogy.com, you can pay a whole lot of money, although it's 40% right off for Christmas, I guess. You can actually gift it to someone for Christmas if you'd like to. I was uh, checking out their website. And they're very fascinated with genealogies, and today what I would love to do is become fascinated with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And if you're not in the front row seats, you may not be able to read this, but this is all of the words, this is all of the names that are in the family tree of Jesus. And uh, I believe that Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, And the composers of the New Testament, those who brought it together, were very intentional about putting this first. That this was pivotal and critical to our understanding of who Jesus is and why he came. And so we're going to jump into that today. And I want to look at four observations and implications to the genealogy, the family tree of Jesus today. And the first one, we'll just jump right in, is it declares that the story of Jesus is rooted in history, not fantasy. And that is good for every one of you today that believes in Jesus, in the gospel of Jesus, that we are not believing a fantasy or a fairy tale. Uh, Fairy tales often begin once upon a time in the land of, or somewhere in a galaxy far, far away, And they start as fairy tale stories. This is not how Matthew chooses to begin his gospel because Jesus didn't begin as a baby in Bethlehem. Jesus has existed for all time, but the story of Jesus in this world and his coming to this world began thousands of years before Jesus ever was born into the world. Uh, this is Jesus' Ancestry.com, if you will. This is Matthew's way of, of just putting it down. Here's who Jesus came from and where Jesus came, and it demonstrates that he was for, far more than a poor carpenter who grew up in an insignificant town called Nazareth. Uh, Matthew, by starting with this, is creating an indisputable link that that links Jewish history of the Old Testament with the central figure of Christianity. He is saying it doesn't, the New Testament doesn't start there. It is new, but it depends upon the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is fulfilled and explained. The Old Testament alone doesn't get us there because it's all pointing to the person of Christ, which we learn about in the New Testament. And Matthew is very specific about this. If you read the gospel, in fact, you should be reading the gospel in the days to come as we walk through this Advent series. And when you do, would you read it this time with a new lens? A lens to see every time he says, uh, according to the prophecy. Because if you start reading it, he continually points back to the Old Testament, the history, uh, through quoting the prophecy. Let me just show this to you in the book of Matthew, just a few verses beyond what was just read. Matthew says this, all this took place 
to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so uh, Matthew is, is effectively saying, listen, we're going to go 700 years back to Isaiah when this was quoted or echoed in Isaiah, and we're going to connect the person of Jesus with the history of God's people. He continues on just a few verses later, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, and so now he's explaining specific things, and so the Magi come, we all love the Magi, they come to King Herod, and King Herod's like, I hear about this king that's coming, tell me about him. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so he's going to Micah there. And showing the link, the indisputable link between Jesus in the New Testament and this person of Jesus, this baby, and all of the history that had been playing out in the years beforehand. He continues on just a few verses later. Again, this is Matthew. And he says in verses, it's coming up here. Oh, and he rose. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, speaking of Joseph now, after Jesus was born. And Joseph, he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and he departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the prophet had spoken by, or what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I shall be called, I called my son. Now, I don't know how many of you have watched The Chosen. If you haven't watched it, you ought to watch it. And it's a uh, a dramatization of the life of Jesus where uh, they certainly speculate some things about people's lives, but really build into it a storyline that stretches your thinking. And one of the things that they do is with this character, with this disciple, Matthew, who is also called Levi, uh, they act, they, it's a very interesting uh, character uh, that they create to uh, explain him as a person. To demonstrate him as a person, and, and and if you've watched it, you know he is uh, a numbers guy. He's an accountant. He is almost annoyingly an accountant, like so focused on the specifics and the numbers. And it's probably true because he was a tax collector. If you're a tax collector for the Roman Empire and you mess up, then it's not good for you, right? Like it, it is really not good for you. And so. Uh, they, they demonstrate Matthew as, as very specific in numbers, and uh, he is an accountant who is writing an account with an accountant brain to give an account of the fact that Jesus' life and story is so much bigger than the 33 years that he lived on earth. Uh, I do know an accountant. Her name is Dolores. Some of you may know Dolores. Glenn knows Dolores because he's involved with the finances here at the church. Dolores is our accountant. Uh, Dolores lets nothing buy. If, uh, if you purchase something, she, you know, you purchase something with a church credit card, it shows up on the church credit card statement, you still have to submit the receipt. If you don't re- uh, submit the receipt, she will track you down. She has a couple of people that she sends out after you. Their names are Lisa and Janet. They both work at Valley Avon, and they come after me. And they say, we need the receipt. Well, I will find some sort of receipt. Sometimes it's an email that I get from a company. You know, uh, uh, when we did Feast at the Farm, they sent something over to me, so I forwarded it on. It didn't have the amount on it. And I think, well, it's kind of like, look, okay, we got a credit card statement that shows Feast, or it shows uh, Flaming Farm, it shows the number, and then we have another statement from them saying that they offered the services. It shows the last four digits of the credit card, but it doesn't have the number. We can put two, to, two together and figure it out. No. That's not good enough. She's a former auditor, I believe. And she dots the I's and she crosses the T's. And it's wonderful. It's great. Because it ensures that every dollar that is spent by this church is spent appropriately and properly. Matthew is writing with an accountant's brain. He is writing in a way so that you will know that he studied this 
to demonstrate that Jesus is not some guy that came out of nowhere. Jesus is the very person, the very God that was proclaimed, the very king that was proclaimed for thousands of years. And he is helping us to understand that Jesus is not a figure of fantasy. He is a figure of history that was all pointing towards him. And that's good for you because your faith is not found founded upon fantasy but history. J.D. Greer, I want to borrow from him just for a moment. He's a pastor, I think, in South Carolina, North Carolina, one of the Carolinas. He says this, Christianity's most important feature is that it is actual history. It actually happened in time and space because the core of Christianity is not a set of principles that Jesus taught to us, but something that Jesus was going to do for us. It is what Jesus, the person of Jesus, did for us that we gather together to celebrate, not a set of principles. And he compares this with other world religions. One, Buddhism, he says, for example, uh, the difference is that in Buddhism, the principles of Buddhism don't depend upon Buddha being the actual, an actual person. Those principles that Buddhists believe undergird the universe, and Buddha was just the masterpiece, the mouthpiece. He also refers to Islam. He says, Islam is a pattern for how Allah wants us to live. Muhammad was just the prophet, the mouthpiece for the teaching. Muslims, of course, will tell you Muhammad was a real, actual person, but principles and teaching, the principles of teachings of Islam do not depend upon him being a real person. This is not the case for Christianity. Or Christ. Christianity depends upon a set of events that actually took place in time and history because the core of Christianity is not what Jesus taught us to do, but what he did for us. And what Matthew is doing is he is building a historical account that goes hundreds of years beforehand and then continues on beyond it so that we will understand this person of Jesus. And so, in just a few weeks, we're going to gather together for a Christmas celebration. It's going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, we're going to actually gather with uh, Valley Avon for Christmas Eve, because Christmas Eve is a Sunday. We can't gather in here on a Sunday. They won't open it up on Christmas Eve for us, and a, a, a few other reasons. So we're just going to gather together for Christmas Eve. So we're going to have a Christmas celebration over at Mill Pond on the Friday night, and it's going to be great. We're just going to sort of gather around. We're going to sing the hymns and the Christmas songs. We're going to read the Christmas story. And we're going to eat lots of treats afterwards and just have an awesome time together. And so I invite you to look out for that and join us for that. But when we gather for the Christmas celebration, we will not be celebrating the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we, we, we believe in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll actually teach coming into the new year some of the principles and the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, but we are gathering to celebrate a person, the second person of the Trinity who came to this world, who fulfilled the Old Testament. It was all pointing to him. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was the Logos that it all pointed towards. And so, as Matthew opens up the gospel, he doesn't open it up with once upon a time. He opens it up before all time and through all time. He has been the focus and he will be our salvation. Number two, the prophecy tells us the, the gospel is a message about the kingdom of heaven, not my personal salvation. Let me restate that. The gospel is a message first and foremost about the kingdom of heaven, not your personal salvation. And what I mean by that is that Jesus didn't come and Matthew didn't present this as sort of a message that you get saved and you get this awesome new future. He presented this, that it was something far bigger than you. In fact, you're not that big in the story. I hate to break it to you. 
Some of us don't like that because we want our lives to be about us and what our future is. And, you know, with a God, little God in my life, that'll make things better. But it's actually way better than that and bigger than that. He's presenting this genealogy to demonstrate that Jesus came uh, to be the king over a kingdom that will never end, that involves a lot of people, and that will reign for all of eternity. And you start to see this in Matthew chapter, in, in 1 verse 1, just kind of the beginning of the genealogy, and this is sort of like the chapter title. Okay, like he gets into the specifics as he gets into the chapter, but this is sort of the higher. And he says, the book of the genealogy or the genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he goes to Abraham and starts to go specifically uh, through that. But we should first begin by asking, why did he begin sort of in the chapter title referring to the son of David and the son of Abraham? Uh, what he is doing here is he's demonstrating that Jesus is inseparably linked to the covenants that God made with Abraham and with David. Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant is a covenant God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 where he said, I will bless you and I will make you into a great nation and through you blessing will come to this world. And so by noting this, he's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa this is the blessing. The blessing is coming through Abraham, but with this child, with this Jesus. He is connected. Uh, but then he first points to Jesus as the son of David. Now this evokes images. If you were uh, a Jewish person in that day, if you knew the Jewish history, if you had studied the Old, Old Testament, this phrase would evoke to you images of a messianic king in the royal line of David with the legal and legitimate rights to carry out this Davidic covenant, this kingship. And so Matthew is demonstrating that Jesus was coming to bring the kingdom of God. Uh, we'll just go back to this covenant that was made with David. David in his later years uh, going back to um, Second uh, Samuel, in Second Samuel 7, in his later years, God sent the prophet Nathan to David, and this is what the prophet said. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, before we move on, let me just say quickly, this is speaking first about Solomon, David's son. He's saying that I will establish Solomon as king. Solomon will build me a house. He will build a temple. But his kingdom will not end with Solomon. His kingdom will proceed to a king that will be born, that will be king forever. And so he continues in verse 16. He says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure for, forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And what Matthew is explaining as he explains this genealogy is that Jesus came and Jesus was the fulfillment of, of this promise to build an everlasting kingdom, that he would be a king that would come to this world and he would save this world and he would change the trajectory of history. And so when you choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, you are not receiving a personal salvation only or even dominantly. What you are doing is you are receiving a new life into a new family and a new kingdom where Jesus is reigning in the world. And even though there is another kingdom that is trying to take you down, that is trying to snatch you out of the hand of God, that is, you know, working to destroy life, to steal, kill, and destroy uh, what 
the invitation, the gospel invitation, is that you would join a kingdom of God and that you would submit to, to the rule and the reign of Christ in your life. A kingdom has um, several different facets. Number one, it has a king. Number two, it has a throne. And Jesus is sitting on the throne today and he is reigning today. And there is nothing that's happening in your life as hard as your life has been. Some of you have experienced great tragedy and hardship this past year. You're going into Christmas season and you're like, I don't even know how I'm going to navigate it through. Uh, Some of you are experiencing extremely difficult times, whether it's with lawsuits or financial matters or with kids or with job or no job or whatever it is. And... What the scriptures say is that you have been invited into a a new realm uh, uh, that gives you hope, an everlasting hope, a living hope. And it's secured in the resurrection of Jesus. And because Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus overcame the power of the kingdoms of this world, so will you if you would choose to kneel to the kingship of Jesus. And he's explaining this as you're going to see that he is from the line of, J- of, of, of David. And he is that king. And so as we walk through this series, the series is called All Hail King Jesus. And we didn't sing this song today. I hope we'll sing it one day during this series. Some of you grew up singing this song. Some of you never heard this song. Should I sing it? Should we give it a try? All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star, and throughout eternity we'll sing your praises and we'll Reign with you throughout eternity. Listen, like we we're gonna This is so much more than your personal salvation. This is about a kingdom that there is a king and he is reigning today, he is sitting on the throne today. And there are citizens, a kingdom has citizens, right? And all the citizens gather together four times, you know, in the courtyard uh, to celebrate the king, to say all hail the king. And that's what we're doing here today. That's what the worship service is, that we would gather together and that we would worship him and that we would put him on his throne in our lives again. Because for some of you this past week, you sort of took him off the throne and you jumped on the throne and started doing things your way. And so that's why there's this routine in our life that we would come back together and be reminded again, oh yeah, I I messed up this week. I took him off the throne and I put other things on the throne. I started to build other homes and other houses. But God is merciful to a thousand generations. And so we come back together and we receive uh, the goodness of God and we remember what Jesus did for our salvation. We put him back on the throne. And so the call today, the invitation to you today, what Matthew went to great lengths to explain over generations and with specificity, is that you would put the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords back on the throne today. Uh, This tells us it's not a gospel of personal salvation, but God's kingdom. And by the way, if you read the scriptures, which you should, notice how the gospel is presented. It's never presented as your personal salvation. In fact, John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus coming, what does he say? He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Like, the kingdom of God is near in Jesus. Like, we're getting, we're experiencing some of the kingdom just by him being here. And by the way, when Jesus preached, he didn't preach the gospel of personal salvation. He preached the kingdom of God. And so may we enter in. By the way, 
when Jesus is your king, it's, it's like, look, I, I am taking any rights that I have to my life and I am setting them aside and I am giving my rights and my life to Jesus. He is king. I am here to serve him. I am here to follow him. It doesn't really matter what I think about some of the rules or the principles or how I should, you know, I should be able to live my life. It's now about how does the king say life should occur within the citizen, citizens of the kingdom. And so I'm just, it's like that song we sang last week. My life is not my own any longer in Christ. I've been purchased, I've been bought, and I've given it all to him, amen? All right, number three. We're gonna get into the prophecy, or excuse me, into the genealogy just a little bit more specific now. Uh, the third thing that it tells us is that the good news of God's kingdom is for everyone. It's for men and women, boys and girls, Red, yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. It's for murderers and adulterers. It's for the morally decent and the morally despicable. The gospel is for everyone. Doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, because it's for everyone. You see this when you get into the genealogy. I'll show it to you in a minute, but just just to kind of give some backdrop to that, I've I've never personally con- completed one of these genealogy online exercises. Uh, I, I'm actually interested to now after studying this, but uh, never done it personally. But I do remember when I was a child uh, bragging about uh, being connected through my family lines to this guy named Brian Orser. Now most of you uh, uh, will not know this name, Brian Orser, because you're not a Canadian and some of you weren't around in the 80s. But in, 19, in the 84, 1984, 1988 Olympics, Brian Orser uh, was a figure skater and he won several Olympic medalists, or s- several uh, Olympic medals. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that he was born in Belleville, Ontario, Canada, which is where I spent most of my years growing up. And in addition to that, he was the second cousin of my dad. And so as a kid in those days, you know, it's like where the Olympics is on and everybody's talking about this guy that, you know, is one of our uh, great hopes for medals at the Olympics. And so as a kid, like in, in, in elementary school class in that day, I'd be like, hey, I'm related to that guy. I've never met that guy. I don't know that I'll ever meet that guy. I don't know anything about that guy other than he's my dad's second cousin. And I'm like bragging about this fact. It's just like every one of you. If you were to do one of the genealogy exercises, tests, or whatever it's called online, and you found out that you were a descendant of, you know, George Washington, you'd be like, hey, you know, I'm like, I'm from the line of George Washington. What you probably wouldn't do and what I didn't do was celebrate and brag about all of the morally reprehensible people that are, you know, that I knew. It's like if you found out that, you know, you were in the line of Hitler or something like that, it's not like, oh, hey, let me just, let me just put that up there and let everybody know. I got the same blood, right? What's interesting is we look at this genealogy, you get into the details of this genealogy, let's just put it up here, is that, well, what's interesting is who is in it and who is not in it. Because the genealogy, if you read it and you kind of say, wait a second, it doesn't seem like they're including everyone in the genealogy of this kingship line, which they... Which they didn't. That was an attention getter, so you went to sleep, pay attention. All right, so when they would make these genealogies, it was common Jewish practice to structure these uh, with literary and symbolic symmetry 
Uh, and so as he structures it in the Bible, if you read it, 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 it looks at three different periods of history and breaks it into 14 uh, kings or 14 individuals. And it's clear that they did this sometimes for, perhaps for memory. It was, it was easier for them to memorize and to remember this. Uh, also to maybe draw upon some of the numerology that they often used. But there were people that were missing from this genealogy. Yet, it's interesting who they chose, who Matthew chose to include. I'll, I'll, I'll share some of the names. He, he chose to include King Ahaz, which he could have easily s- selected some other kings. King Ahaz, if you remember the story, was... Uh, just a, a, a despicable king. He desecrated the temple of God. Uh, on one occasion, he was fearful for his life, and so he went to Syria to meet with the king of Assyria who came, and he was inspecting his temple and thinking like, hey, if I could get his God to protect me, uh, I'd be better off. And so he lets everyone know in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem temple, hey, build an idol, build the God of Assyria and he desecrated the temple, of which, and he brought all of these disgusting and despicable practices into Israel, and yet, he's included in the gene- genealogy of Jesus. Another person is Manasseh, King Manasseh, Second Kings 21.16 says this of Manasseh, he shed so much blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. Matthew is very intentional about who he's including, and there's a reason for it, which we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, Some of the other people that he chose to include in this genealogy was women, which typically were not included in Jewish genealogies because they trace the descent of an individual through the man or the head of the family. And yet... He chooses to include five women in this genealogy, probably because he's hanging around with Jesus, and Jesus is like, no, the women are really important too. In fact, it doesn't really happen without the women, right? So he's like, we got to get women in the family tree of Jesus. But notice some of the women that he includes. One is Rahab. She was a prostitute. She, um, by faith, uh, saved uh, two men. Uh, the spies. He also includes Bathsheba, although he doesn't name Bathsheba. It's interesting because he, he, let me just actually read it here, if I can find it. He says, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of David, the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. He doesn't actually name her, but he names Uriah, the wife of Uriah. Why does he do that? Probably to trigger their minds to to mention that she was the adulteress that committed adultery with David and therefore killed brought the, on the death of Uriah. I mean, this is not someone to brag about in the genealogy of Jesus. Another person that's in there, a woman that's in there, is Tamar. If you think about the different women that could be named, there's a lot of others that you sort of think about, but Tamar, if you know the story, uh, she, through some very tragic circumstances, through the death of two of her husbands and the unfulfilled promise of Judah, her father-in-law Judah, uh, she dressed up, hold tight here, hopefully we don't have a lot of kids in the room, she dressed up as a prostitute, tricked Judah, got him to sleep with her, this is her father-in-law, and then became pregnant and bore two boys named Perez and Zerah. It's kind of one of those stories that you're, like in the book of Genesis, that when someone comes to Christ and and, and you, you like, don't start there. Because it's super messed up. And you start to read through the book of Genesis sometimes, and you're like, why on earth? These people were so reprehensible. And it's true. Oh, how we needed a Savior. 
I mean, it just shows how bad it is. And before the Mosaic Law was on the scene, how bad it really was. And even after it came on the scene, how bad it still was. The story is told of a a pastor who uh, wanted his kids to hear the Word of God as they were going to sleep at night, and so he bought those CDs, you know, back in the day, the CDs that that read the stories of God, and he put it on as the kids were going to sleep at night, elementary school kids as they were going to sleep at night, and they got up in the morning, and they would sit around the breakfast table, and the kids were asking questions like, hey, what's incest and what's a prostitute and and all this stuff, and the, the pastor was like, who is teaching you these words? He's like, the kids are like, well, we're hearing it from the Bible. And he says, all right, no more reading the Bible. We're watching TV from now on. Why, why did he include this story? Let me read it to you. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. One of the messed up stories of the Old Testament I think because he wanted to demonstrate that the gospel was for everyone. Men and women. The most reprehensible of circumstances, Jesus came to this world to change the trajectory of the world. And that was the past, but he was coming for a new future. And by the way, this is the New Testament, not the Old Testament. This is the pivotal point in history where all of that old is changing and there is something new that's coming. And it's out of that and for that that Jesus is coming. If you're here today, I don't know what you have trailing behind you in your life. Jesus came for you. He came to save you. By the way, the name Jesus is comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua, Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. It's a beautiful name. Yahweh, our God, saves. And he brought salvation through Jesus Christ. Here's the final point, and worship team, why don't you come, because we're going to sing and celebrate the name of Jesus, and then we're going to go and live for him as our king. But number four, the genealogy of Jesus prepares us to learn that God is for us and with us. He put it in there to prepare us. So as we start to read this Christmas story once again, that we would know that God came for us, that God loves us. I'll just jump into some of the texts for next week. Uh, But Matthew chapter 1, verses 20. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is Joseph in a dream. Joseph was about to put away his betrothed wife, Mary. He appeared to him in a dream, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That which is conceived is not carrying, even though he's in the line, he's not carrying that sin that was in all of them. He's from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yahweh saves, for he will save people from their sins. And he continues on, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. See, when this world couldn't get it right, and I'll tell you what, the whole Old Testament, which is two-thirds of the Bible, is just a long story of people that couldn't get it right. God, did, like, he gave them prophets, he gave them a space to live, he freed them from exiles, he uh, just over and over, and O oh, kings, prophets, judges, over and over again, they couldn't get it right. And when they couldn't get it right, God eventually said, I'm going to come in the flesh and I'm going to do for you what you could never do for yourself. And Jesus came and he died on the cross and he rose again and he's reigning today. Amen. Amen. And this prepares us. It gets us ready for this amazing story. Amen. Would you stand with me? couple things, a couple words just in closing here today. Number one, let's go back to that tree. 
your genealogy matters. Your genealogy matters. And I can guarantee this, I don't know your genealogy, and probably some of you don't know your genealogy, but if you were to actually figure out some stuff about the lives of the people that have come before you, you'd be like, I'm not sure that I really want this to be in a book that's read for a thousand years. But in Jesus, you get a new genealogy. Do you understand this? Like in Jesus, you are brought into the family of God. You are adopted into the family of God, and you become part of the kingdom of God. And it sets a new future for you. An everlasting future and kingdom with him in heaven. Your genealogy matters. And my question to you is, will you today hail King Jesus?